funny it seems Holly would like to be behind, you know, in the green room. Really appreciate that introduction and thank you so much. And I'm glad to be here because um, I'm now kind of an energy storage fanatic. Uh, and I would have to say that while I've worked in energy policy and been a promoter of uh, putting much more renewable sources into our electricity mix and just into gen, uh, you know overall generation up and down the state for a very long time, um, I hadn't really appreciated energy storage until um, Janice Lynn, prior to CESA being formed, brought it to my attention. And at that point, our governor, Jerry Brown, was the attorney general, and he and I don't know if it was so much he personally, though it certainly fits Jerry's profile, because if I uh, step back a little and tell you a little uh, anecdote about me, I was, as mentioned, a UC Berkeley student, and uh, Jerry was governor, governor one then. And he, Sim Vanderen, whom some of you may have heard of, was the head of his Office of Appropriate Technology. Jerry Brown had two offices, he had Solar Cal and the Office of Appropriate Technology, along with the Energy Commission and the CPUC. So he had this big emphasis, as we know, you know, Governor Moonbeam, for always thinking outside of the box. Well, the Office of Appropriate Technology set up some funding and offered grants to university uh, facilities to be UC Offices of Appropriate Technologies, UCATs. So I saw that. And I got my department to apply for one of those grants. And our department then got the grant. And uh, I was, for a very short time, you know, hired to work at uh, UC Berkeley's UC Office of Appropriate Technology, which was in my uh, degree program at uh, undergrad. So um, Jerry Brown wasn't talking storage then that I know of. But the point being that you know, he's always been that kind of thinker. But when he was Attorney General, he had staff specifically devoted to looking at climate change, which seems kind of funny. Why is your you know, chief law enforcement office of your state looking at climate change? But they were. And part of the issue was, at that time, the EPA did not consider carbon dioxide or other uh, global warming emissions part of the Clean Air Act. And there was a push by states to say, wait a minute, this needs to be regulated. And so Jerry Brown joined in lawsuits to basically force the federal government to do so. And he, was, he had this team of his uh, in the AG's office who were looking at um, climate change and then looking at whenever there's settlements of these lawsuits, what would they use the funding for to uh, basically to fund in California to actually make a significant impact on our reducing California's emissions. And it was there when they were looking at renewable energy and increasing. This was before the 33% RPS that we have now, meaning renewable portfolio standard. Um, they were looking at, okay, California, in order to achieve any, and this was also before AB 32, which is our Global Warming Solutions Act. They were saying, you know, to really reduce greenhouse gas emissions in California, we're gonna have to do a lot more about renewables, but you know, there's this intermittency of renewables, so how do we address that? And that's when his staff latched on storage. And they started to think, look, there needs to be, in the same way that we require um, our IOUs to procure a certain amount of renewable energy, maybe they need to procure storage. So my second uh, term in office, 2010, uh, it's brought to my attention that uh, there's interest in this bill and that we should do a procurement on storage, so I carry it. And um, at that point, and actually I think it was 29, I think my staff put 2010, I think it was 2009, but uh, because um, Governor Brown was actually elected governor in 2010. Um, but anyway, um, when we introduced it, I mean, it was as if we... I don't know what analogy I want to make, but it was sort of people looked at us like, huh? And they also was like, what? This is crazy. This is way too, you know, what a lovely idea, but we're talking, you know, whoa, way into the future. And how dare we even consider requiring 
in the procurement some amount of storage. And uh, the utilities, of course, were opposed to the bill. This is AB 2514. The um, CPUC was opposed to the bill. I mean, basically, we hardly had any. We had the Attorney General for it. We had storage companies for it. But everybody else was just looking at us like we were crazy. Interestingly enough, that fall, I went with a group of utility uh, um, executives as well as other energy folks and a lot of legislators to Spain with this group, CEPI, the California Foundation on Energy and Environment. And they were also, or economy, energy, economy, and environment, they were also very, very, very skeptical. And we were going to Spain to look at, I mean, part of the reason they chose Spain was kind of, this was one of the poster children for how they did, in their opinion, renewables wrong. Because their, um, their feed-in tariff was too high and was affecting the, you know, their, their implementation and their whole uh, price of renewables. So we're on this trip. And we go to what's equivalent in Spain of their ISO, which is called Red Electric. And the first thing out of the people's mouth, the experts there, is storage is the game changer. Storage is the thing you need to integrate your renewables. Then we go to another location. I forget exactly where. Um, very large multinational energy company. First thing out of their mouth, storage is the game changer. So after about the third stop in this trip where we're hearing this, some of the utility experts turn to me and they go, what you do? You know, program these people? Did you set this up in advance? And I'm like, hey, I had nothing to do with any of our visits or anything. So it really changed the whole nature of the discussion once they heard from experts that they respected that really storage had a huge role to play in, obviously, our California goals around renewables. Now, for me, my attraction to it was more than that. My attraction, for any of you who look at the electricity planning in California, when you look at all the planning documents in terms of the growth of electricity, it's basically, the, the growth is almost entirely falls within a certain set of hours on a certain number of days in a year. So all the peaker plants that we are sort of scheduled or expecting to build over whatever next 10, 20 year period are to address this very narrow window of need. And yet we know even the highly efficient peaker plants, are they're fossil, they have other um, negative environmental attributes, and if we can store our generation, and if we can utilize it beyond just being limited by the time of generation, then we could also address this need for those peaker plants. So that was another very strong attraction to me. Um, now, what else did I want to talk to you about? Uh, so I mentioned when I introduced it, and I, there's ex examples which, of my describing them to you, you probably know them better than me. I mean, for example, Bright Sources, um, their seven plant project, which is only a six plant project, but when it was first proposed, it was a seven plant project. But then, as a smart company would do, you, you know, you're always looking at how do I make my project most cost effective? They were able, by integrating storage into that solar project, of which Ivan Paz one of the facilities, they, were, they eliminated one of the plants because they incorporated the molten salt storage process into, and they, so those six plants are now producing the same output with the integration of the molten salt storage as they would have projected originally under their seven plant proposal. Um, so, what's the status of 2514? Um, the PUC began the rulemaking a year ahead of schedule. They did their first draft or phase one of the decision in um, August of 2012, so a lot of you probably followed that. And the decision didn't uh, recommend adoption of a target, which some of us were disappointed about. Um, basically, they said that they, the CPUC and the ISO, didn't know what the future needs of the grid would be. They also felt that how do they deal with a cost recovery project? Because while they know how to value generation, they don't know how to value storage. So we need to help those of us who have some ways for them to wrap around the concept of how to value storage need to, give, need to feed input now. Um, 
their phase two, which they're in the process right now, has been assigned to Carla Peterman. Carla Peterman was on the Energy Commission. She is now on the CPUC, so newly appointed. She's brilliant. Uh, graduate from uh, Cal at the Energy and Resources. Um, I'm pleased that she was the person not only appointed, but now she's the assigned commissioner to this issue. And the CPUC is taking input at this moment in terms of this phase two. Um, so I would recommend, if you care like I do or agree, that there needs to be specific storage <laughs> targets. You need to communicate to them now. And the bill, when we first wrote it and introduced it, recommended a 3 to 5 percent procurement requirement. We dropped that in order to get it through. And we, uh, we basically compromised to give more flexibility to the PUC to make those determinations, but we never eliminated the concept of a target. So we don't want a situation, or at least I don't, where they basically ignore that part. Um, uh, the PUC staff report in January, just this last January, said that it's still a open consideration and that, but the way they worded it, it said the major issue in this proceeding is whether procurement targets for energy storage are appropriate and if so, how much should be procured. So uh, opinions on that subject should be weighed in now. They're also considering whether storage should be a preferred resource um, to signal the benefits that storage might bring to our utility system. And uh, I think it should be considered a preferred resource or a favored resource because it helps us meet system needs for capacity, for ancil ancillary, I always have pronounced that word, ancillary services. Um, and because it allows us, just in simple terms, to utilize our generation capacity with, in hopefully many cases, not having to add extra capacity. Um, the ultimate decision is due by October 1st, 2013. So like I said, educate away. Um, I'm also carrying a bill this year, AB 1258, some of you may have heard about that one. And it requires the CPUC to open a new proceeding or expand any existing proceeding they might have to determine the potential use of existing hydroelectric facilities, um, the, the pumping uh, storage facilities. The intent is so that the load service entities would maximize our existing um, pump hydro. So example is um, the Helms storage facility that PG&E operates. Uh, there's some other ones I mentioned in the bill that they should look at. Uh, Meadow, Oroville, Castaic, a couple of others. Um, and PG&E is uh, um, looking like they're going to be supporting the bill. You know, not, I don't mean that they're still wavering. They, it's probably they're going to go officially on support very soon. And they were happy to see that uh, they're, they're looking forward to figuring out other ways to utilize that facility to really fit into um, their procurement requirements and their facility resource requirements. Um, the other thing I've, I've tried to track, you know, I obviously have uh, a lot of other things on my agenda. I've got, I'm carrying for some of you who may have been uh, seeing the um, press, a bullet bill around uh, guns and bullets. So, you know, I have a, a, I've got a pretty broad portfolio that I'm interested in, but I do try to track the new developments in storage and companies, new companies that have started, uh, new R&D, things like that. And I was sort of excited to learn about the liquid metal battery technology that is use, using metal and salt layers that self-separate based on density difference. Um, so that, that to me was uh, another good breakthrough. There's a number of very small companies that are spin-offs from UC Berkeley and LBNL in my district that are looking at uh, storage, um, basically new technologies and uh, uh, not only researching but testing. So that's very exciting to me. Um, 
I'll take questions. There's more I could say, but I want to give you some time to be able to ask me questions. Wonderful. Let's thank Assembly Member Skinner for joining us. And we'll open it up to audience questions. Uh, hi, Neil Aronson, uh, Integrated Clean Energy. Specific to your um, pumped hydro bilk, uh, mm -hmm. what what is that already been proposed? And so, what's the number? And and right. what, will it also include um, um, uh, Central Valley Water Project uh, facilities? So the bill has been introduced. It's AB twelve fifty eight. It hasn't been heard in committee yet, um, but it will be heard. I have eight bills that are being heard in committee next week. I'm not sure if it's one of them, but it will be heard either next week or the following because um, all assembly bills have to get out of what we call get out of the house of origin by the end of May. So they have to get out of policy committee in this month and in early May. Um, and let's see, it's, um, I specified a few other facilities that I want the PUC to assess but I don't think I limited them to it. And the ones I specified are, as I mentioned, um, the Helms, Balsam, Meadow, Oroville, Castaic, and San Luis. So I don't think, I think I was silent on that water project that you described. And what I could do is look back and see if I've given it enough flexibility. Other questions? Uh, hi, uh, Judith Schwartz from To The Point. How do you and your colleagues evaluate technologies that are, you know, some of these things are very complicated and, you know, how do you look past who has the best lobbyist to really educate yourselves about what is really going to be practical or what can be done or what might sound good but isn't really achievable? What kind of process do you all use and are there ways that the people here can help with that? Well, I appreciate the question. It's one of the things, while I might I wouldn't purport to be the best expert, though I have more expertise than many of my colleagues. But that said, I think it's a mistake for any of us in the legislature, by and large, to write bills that are so specific, to ever write legislation that mandates, you know, so rigidly either a particular technology or a particular approach. Targets to me, goals and targets, I think are appropriate and giving them to the appropriate bodies like the Public Utilities Commission or the Energy Commission to then evaluate, they're both, they can then, you know, set, both they can do that assessment, they can also create flexibility and they also have the ability to go back quicker than we do to make adjustments if their first iteration of something isn't quite right. If we so narrowly proscribe exactly how to do it or what to do, almost always, I mean, if we think about the energy crisis, now while we are very seriously gained and it wasn't just a, a flaw in the legislation, there was too much prescription there. Uh, New York State now has uh, signed into the law that the micro uh, micro grids will be part of the infrastructure moving forward. Uh, do you see that uh, California would also reach that kind of uh, uh, thinking soon in the near future? That's great. I hadn't, um, I wasn't really familiar with that, so I'll have to look at it because I love um, imitating New York law. <laughs> I did that on. Uh, New York um, actually inspired uh, California, our um, brick and mortar or main street businesses, regardless of whether they were small businesses or big like Target and Home Depot, were being put at a huge tax disadvantage by internet retailers who weren't collecting sales tax. And we, we were thwarted by this because under federal law, the definition for a nexus to be able to charge sales tax was you had to have physical presence. And, you know, we weren't able to figure out, okay, how do you have these internet entities that don't have physical presence in California, how do you get them to do what they really should be doing, which is collecting the sales tax, because you and I owe it anyway. And then New York came
came up with a whole new concept for Nexus, and it passed in New York and then passed their court. So I basically took that concept, passed it, and now California, if you're in California and you order online on Amazon, you will have sales tax collected. Um, but anyway, so back to your point on microgrids, um, it seems to me that's really smart, and especially given that we have the governor has the very ambitious goal of the 12, 12 Gigab gigawatts. gigawatts, yes, of distributed generation, and that clearly microgrids would facilitate that, or at least be a, you know, a complement. So hopefully there will be folks either at the PUC or in the governor's office who can, I guess what I'd say is I wouldn't introduce the bill right now because there's a lot of, the utilities are very upset, for example, about net metering, about there's a whole lot of policies that you and I might feel are totally sound that have, that are creating a lot of headache right now and um, whether fairly or not, and there's legislators who are a bit nervous, and so um, rather than jumping ahead and introducing legislation, if we have some of our experts kind of get out there and make the case for the need and the need in association with the existing California policy, it creates an easier climate, if I might use that term, to have the discussion. More questions? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Bruno Presta. I am with EPRI, Electric Power Research Institute, and also with EDF, a French company. Question relates to, your, to the targets of AB 2514. Uh, you mentioned 2015 and 20. Do you think it's possible to reach targets within two years or within seven years? when it comes to storage? Let me see, I don't think it was yeah. 2015, I think it was actually 2016, but let uh, me 16. look. Right. Let me look at my notes. End of 2015. End of 2015, right, right. Yeah, so technically it's the beginning of, yeah. Um, well, when the bill was first passed, yes. <laughs> but uh, like many things, um, and I'm, I'm not going to fault the PUC. I think it's important for them to be deliberative. It is important. But I would say stakeholders need to uh, communicate to them loud and clear. That will help. Uh, and then, of course, the initial one is we get closer to that year. It, maybe it's a very, very, very modest one. Do we have any more questions from the audience? <coughs> All right, well, with that, I would like to take one more chance to thank Assemblymember Skinner for joining us here today. <laughs>